up to this point, we covered two types of games. Games in normal form, which are static, and then games in extensive form, which are dynamic. However, in both of those models, there's one ingredient that is uh, missing, and that ingredient is asymmetric information. So far, we assumed that players know each other's preferences well, and of course, um, you know, we can easily find applications in which this is not the case. So one example of such application would be auctions. When you participate in an auction, you don't really know what the preferences of other people who are participating in the auction are. Namely, you don't know what, how much uh, do these um, opponents value uh, the object that is for sale. And so to analyze situations like auctions, we need to introduce a new component into, um, into the game. And that component is asymmetric information. Uh, we're going to introduce it in both static and dynamic games. And we're going to start with static games because those are uh, simpler. Um, so static games with incomplete information or with asymmetric information about the player's preferences are called Bayesian games. And it will become clear why they are called that um, uh, when I come to the uh, to the solution for these games. Uh, but for now, let's start with a simple example. A simple example is a game that is depicted over here, and I'm going to explain how to read this. Um, there are two players, uh, player one and player two, and uh, player one has, um, and, and each player has uh, two actions available. One of the actions is B and the other one is S. Um, Therefore, there are four action profiles in this game when both players are playing B, when one of them plays S and the other one plays B, uh, when it's the reverse, and then we, when, when both are playing um, S. And player one has the following payoffs for these four different strategy profiles or actions profiles. Uh, uh, when both are playing B, he, he's going to get two. When he's playing S and the other person is playing B, he gets zero. Uh, when he's playing B and the other person plays um, S, he gets zero. And when uh, both of them are playing S, he gets one. And that's why the numbers in this matrix are exactly the same as the first number in this matrix. Okay? Now, uh, what's different in this game um, when we compare it to a standard normal form game is the player two. So player two can be one of the two types. Um, he can either the payoffs that are depicted in this matrix, namely when both are playing B, he can get one. When the actions are mismatched, i.e. it's SB or BS, uh, he's going to get zero. And when both are playing S, he's going to get two. So that's one possibility for player two. The other possibility for player two is uh, the payoffs that are depicted in this matrix um, when both are playing B or both are playing S, he's going to get zero. And when the um, actions are mismatched, he either gets one or two. And for this example, we're going to assume that um, this player can be one of the two types. And I'm going to refer to those types as W1 and W2. Um, player two will know his own type. So when he's born, when he starts playing this game, he knows whether he is... Uh, he has these preferences or those preferences. However, uh, player one does not know whether he's facing uh, player two of this type or player two of this type. So player one has some uncertainty about the preferences of player two in this game. And we're going to quantify this uncertainty. We're going to assume that player one uh, thinks that player two can be of this type with probability pi, and he can be of this type with probability one minus pi. Okay. Now, if you look at this game, this is exactly what, what we, uh, you know, this is exactly what we were asking for in the, in the introduction. There is some asymmetric information because player one is in, not informed about the preferences of player two, but player two is informed about his own preferences. So something that player two knows is not revealed to player one. 
Uh, however, player one has some idea, has some rough idea, which is de described in these probabilistic terms. He thinks that player one is of type W1 with probability pi. How do we attack such a game? Well, in general, we're going to use uh, the following very simple trick. We're going to assume that player two is not a single player, but there are two of the, of the, of the players too. Okay, there's player two of this type and player two of that type, and we're going to think of them as two separate players, two different people. And then we're going to rewrite this game as a game of three players. There's going to be player one, and then player two w1, and then player two w2. So I'm going to refer to them as um, player one, and then w1 and w2. And this is going to represent player two when he's of this type and this when he's of that type. Um, and I'm going to assume that um, player one is going to choose a matrix and player two of type w1 is going to choose um, uh, a row and then this player is going to choose a column and I'm going to rewrite this game as a game of three players and I'm going to take into account the fact that uh, player one is uncertain about whether it's w1 playing against him or w2 playing against him and uh, to, to represent that fact what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw uh, uh, a small diagram here um, this is going to be player one and um, there's going to be player W1 and W2. And what's going to happen is the nature, so I'm going to introduce uh, a fictitious character in this game, nature. And nature is going to flip a coin and it's going to pair up player one with one of these two players. Uh, this is going to happen with probability pi and this is going to happen with probability one minus pi. And when the nature matches the two players together, um, uh, W1 will know that he's playing against player one, but one will not know whether uh, he's playing against W1 or W2, but he will know that the, the nature has decided that it just didn't reveal um, um, this information to player one. Okay, so player one, as I promised, is going to choose B or S and it's going to be slightly confusing because all the actions have the same labels across all three players but player one is choosing the matrix so there's going to be one matrix here and, and the other one over here um, and now player W1 is going to choose B or S and um, uh, player W2 is going to choose B or S and in this matrix there will be three payoffs written um, one for player one, the other one for player W1 and the third one is for player W2 Okay, now let me fill these payoffs. So here are the payoffs. Let me explain how they come about. So let's say we're looking at uh, a strategy profile where player one plays B, uh, player two plays, um, when he's W1 he plays B, and when he's W2 he also plays B. Uh, in that case, um, note that both types of um, uh, player two are playing the same action if we're in this strategy profile. That means that my uh, payoff uh, is deterministic as player one. So when I play B and my opponents play B, I get two. So that's why there's two over here. Uh, at the same time, 
the payoffs of my opponent when he's w1 is going to be 1, that comes from here, and it's going to be 0, this comes from here. Okay? And we fill in th this matrix in, in a similar fashion, so we go cell by cell and we look up the, um, the payoffs in, this, in these matrices, except for um, uh, this payoff here, this payoff here, this payoff here, and this payoff here. These four are special, and here's why they are special. So let's look at um, a strategy profile B, B, S, so we're in this cell. So note that this strategy profile tells me that uh, type W1 plays B and type W2 plays S, so there's a difference in what my opponent is going to play depending on, on, on his type. Um, if I play B and my opponent plays B and he's W1, then I'm going to get 2. However, that happens only with probability pi, because that's the probability when I'm facing type W1. So that 2 must be multiplied by the probability pi in order to get the expected payoff, uh, plus uh, when I play B and my opponent is W2 and he plays S, um, I find myself in this cell over here, and there I get 0. So here there must be plus 0 times 1 minus pi, but of course 0 times 1 minus pi is 0, so overall this is just 2 pi. And once again, um, there are probabilities featuring in these payoffs because um, when I play B and my opponents play B or S depending on their type, I'm facing a lottery because if I am in this state, I'm going to get 2 and this happens with probability pi. And if I am in this state, I'm going to get 0 and that happens with probability 1 minus pi. The expected value of that lottery for me is 2 pi. Okay, and the expected value of the lottery um, in, in this um, strategy profile is 2 times 1 minus pi. Uh, here it's 1 minus pi and here is pi. Okay, and note that I've taken this um, uh, setup and I rewrote it as a game of three players and I essentially um, removed all the uncertainty and I replaced it with the expected payoffs. So instead of having a lottery, I just said, well, that lottery is worth 2 pi for me. For instance, in this strategy profile, I'm just going to write down the payoff of 2 times pi. Um, and now this is a game, this is a game in normal form. There are three players. There's no asymmetric information in this representation, so I can just solve for uh, a Nash equilibrium in this game. And so once I solve for a Nash equilibrium in this game, um, I'm going to get what we call a Bayesian Nash equilibrium for this game. Okay. Now, of course, when we solve these kind of games, we're not going to go through the troubles of rewriting the normal form um, uh, games, uh, uh, the, the games in normal form with, you know, with these fictitious players. We're going to sort of solve for Bayesian Nash equilibria straight away, but we're going to keep in mind that this is what is hidden, you know, behind the curtain when we work out our um, answers. So now let me get rid of all this and actually look for equilibria, uh, Bayesian Nash equilibria in this example. Let us start with the strategy profile, which looks like this. Player 1 plays B, and uh, player 2 plays B when he's type W1, and uh, plays S when he's W2. So remember, we have a game of um, three players, essentially, and uh, these two players are two uh, different incarnations of player 2, and this is player 1. So this is a pure strategy profile, <clears throat> and we're going to check whether this strategy profile is um, uh, a Bayesian Nash equilibrium. Let's start with player two, because um, for this player it's going to be easier to check uh, the incentives. Um, and let's ask whether player two has a profitable deviation. Uh, we're going to have to ask two different incarnations of player two, so we're going to first ask this guy whether it's profitable to deviate from B 
2s over here, and then we're going to ask this guy whether it's profitable to deviate from s uh, to b over here. Um, so remember, player 1 is playing b, and if we're asking uh, player w1, or uh, the type w1 of player 2, then um, he's playing b here, so he's getting a payoff of 1. If he deviates from b to s, he's going to get a payoff of 0. Um, clearly, this is not a profitable deviation, so uh, w1 does not have any profitable deviations here. Let's look at w2. For w2, we have to look at this matrix. Um, again, we keep in mind that our uh, player 1 is playing b, and uh, player 2 is playing s. Uh, he gets the payoff of 2. If he deviates to b, he's going to get a payoff of 0. That's not profitable. So we conclude from that that player 2 doesn't have profitable deviations. Okay, and now all we need to check is that player 1 doesn't have profitable deviations. For that, we will need to do a little bit of work. Um, we would need to look at the payoff, the expected payoff, in fact, um, uh, u1 uh, from this strategy profile, just for the sake of uh, 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 notations, I'm going to call it s. Okay, just to save some space. What is the payoff? Well, uh, if I'm player 1, then I'm going to get 2 with probability pi over here. And, and zero with probability one minus pi over here, right? Because I'm matched with this player, with this type of player with probability pi and with this type of player with probability one minus pi. So this overall gives me two times pi. If I deviate, if I play, uh, this is a, a very unfortunate choice of notations. Let me call this sigma. So if I deviate to playing s and my opponent is going to play, keep playing sigma, so I'm going to put sigma minus 1 over here, um, then here's what's going to happen. Uh, if I play s, w1 keeps playing b, so I'm going to get 0 over here. Um, and over here, w2 keeps playing s, so I'm going to get 1 over here. Overall, I'm going to get 1 minus pi times 1. There are no profitable deviations if 2 pi is larger than 1 minus pi. Or if pi is larger than 1 third. Now remember that pi is something that is given to us. I didn't specify the number here, but, uh, but really, uh, it's it's just some you know it's just some number that everybody knows. And from these derivations, we can conclude that this strategy profile will be an equilibrium of this game as long as this parameter pi that we're given is above one third. So um, intuitively, if type w one is um, more likely is, is, is likely to appear uh, with at least one third of a chance uh, as the player one's opponent, then playing BBS is a good idea. And in fact, if you just um, check these payoffs, if you look at these games, you, you can see that this is a game uh, of coordination where the two players are trying to coordinate. So when they do coordinate, they get some positive payoffs. And when they uh, mismatch the actions, they get zero. And this is the game of hide and seek where um, player one is trying to get, guess the location of player two and player two is trying to avoid um, player one. And now if you check this strategy profile, um, you can see that uh, when they play this, they, they achieve coordination when the opponent is w1. However, when the opponent is w2, the opponent manages to escape 
player one. And of course, this is gonna be an equilibrium uh, when the first scenario is, is relatively more likely than the second scenario. Well, this relative likeness comes from the payoff. So of course there's a, you know, there's a gain of playing BB in here and there's a loss of playing BS in, in here. And uh, depending on the sizes of those gains and losses, you're gonna have some threshold for pi. In this particular case, this threshold is pi being above one third. What about some other strategy profiles? Well, um, let me consider another one that looks like this, S, uh, comma S, comma B. Um, from my discussions earlier about this being uh, a coordination game and this being uh, a game of hide and seek, we know that uh, all the other pure strategy profiles, for instance, a profile where this is S, this is B, and this is B, uh, are not going to be uh, based in Nash equilibria because um, when first player plays B, the second player, the types of the second player are going to best reply with the B and S. And when the first player plays S, the second player is going to best reply with S and B. And so any other strategy profile is going to fail to be a Bayesian Nash equilibrium because the second player is going to have a profitable deviation. So uh, this is the only pure strategy profile that we are left with that may be an equilibrium. Um, and as I just said, um, the second player doesn't have a profitable deviation in this strategy profile. So all we got to do is we're going to check the incentives of player one. Uh, I'm going to call it sigma hat. Uh, what is the utility of player one from playing sigma hat? Well, if he plays S and his opponent plays S, he's going to get one uh, with probability pi. Um, and here he's playing S as he, and his opponent plays B, so he's going to get zero uh, with probability one minus pi. So overall, his payoff is pi. Um, the only devi deviation that he can entertain is to go from S to B. And his payoff from playing B where his opponent keeps playing according to this strategy profile sigma hat will be the following. Um, so when he plays B, his opponent plays S in this state, so he's gonna get zero. And here the opponent plays B, so here he's gonna get two. And that happens with probability one minus pi. So his overall payoff is two times one minus pi. Uh, this profitable, de this deviation is not profitable. If pi is larger than two, one minus pi, or if pi is above two thirds. Okay, and again, the, the, the intuition behind this equilibrium is the same as before. Um, they're playing, um, player one manages to coordinate with player two in state W1, but player two manages to avoid him in state W2. So as long as this state where the, where the first player gets some positive payoff is likely enough, uh, i.e. as long as the probability of this state is above two thirds, that's an equilibrium. If the probability of this state is below two thirds, then this is not an equilibrium because player one will have a profitable deviation. We exhausted all the pure strategy profiles. And now you may ask, what about the mixed strategy profiles? Well, in order to um, deal with the mixed strategy profiles, let me first parameterize them. So we're gonna say that um, player one is gonna play B with probability alpha, and then he's gonna play S with probability one minus alpha. Um, Player two, when he's type W1, he's gonna play B with probability beta and S with probability uh, one minus beta. And uh, when he's type W2, he's gonna play B with probability gamma and S with probability one minus gamma. And note here that this probability is not equal to, the, to beta because in different states, um, 
uh, player two may play uh, a different action in a sense. So uh, what he does in state w1 is different from what he does in state w2. Yeah. All right. And um, from our previous discussion, we know that we looked at all the cases where player one is playing a pure strategy, meaning that now we only need to consider the cases where alpha is strictly between zero and one. We don't have to consider the case where alpha is equal to zero or where alpha is equal to one because we already did that in our previous discussion. We are going to start by considering a case where gamma is strictly between zero and one as well. All right. Um, so if gamma is uh, strictly between zero and one, uh, that means that uh, the type W2 of player two is indifferent between playing B and S because that's the only reason for, for, uh, for this player to, to mix. Um, so from this, we can conclude that uh, the utility that this type is going to get from playing B must be exactly the same as the utility that he's going to, or the payoff that he's going to get from playing S, conditional on uh, player one playing this mixed strategy alpha. So uh, U2, uh, and so this is the payoff from playing uh, B, uh, when the state is w2 and when everybody else is playing according to uh, uh, this mixed strategy profile. So that will be, um, it's going to get uh, 0 uh, with probability alpha and it's going to get 1 with probability 1 minus alpha. So that is 1 uh, minus alpha. And the payoff from playing s under the same circumstances will be um, with probability 2, sorry, with probability alpha, uh, he's going to get 2, and with probability 1 minus alpha, he's going to get 0. So this is 2 uh, times alpha. Since we are considering the case where gamma is strictly between 0 and 1, uh, the player must be indifferent between b and s, so 1 minus alpha must be equal to um, to alpha, and from that we can conclude that alpha is equal to uh, one-third. Okay, so let me put it here. Alpha then will be equal to one-third. And um, given this observation, now we can uh, see what happens with uh, type W1. Um, what is the payoff from playing B for type W1? Well, this will be uh, 1 times alpha plus 0 times 1 minus alpha. This is just alpha, which is one third, as we just concluded. And what is the payoff from playing S under the same circumstances? That is zero with probability alpha plus two with probability one minus alpha. So it's two times one minus alpha. And that, if I plug in alpha equal to one third, that is going to be four thirds. Note that four-thirds is strictly larger than one-third, which means that player two, when he's in state w1, he strictly prefers to play s over b. Uh, and that is the same as saying that uh, beta is equal to zero. So if beta is equal to zero, then player, one, player two is playing uh, what, what turns out to be a, a pure action, which is uh, uh, with probability one, he's just playing S. One thing left to find, which is gamma. 
And in order to find gamma, we're gonna use something that we haven't used before, uh, you know, so far, which is the incentives for player one. Um, as you uh, probably remember, we said that alpha is between zero and one strictly, which means that player one is indifferent between playing B and S. So once we write down this indifference condition, it's gonna give us an equation uh, for gamma and we would be able to solve for that. So let us do that. So what is the utility or what is the payoff for player one when he plays B, um, when everybody else follows the, um, uh, the strategy profile? Well, um, with probability pi, he will, be, he will find himself in this state. And in this state, when he plays B, he gets two with probability beta. And remember, beta is zero. So um, he gets two with probability beta. And then he gets zero with probability one minus beta. And then with probability one minus pi, um, he is, so this is one minus pi, uh, so he's in this state, uh, he's gonna get two with probability gamma, and he's gonna get zero with probability minus one minus gamma. Overall, um, this whole thing is zero because beta is zero, so uh, we can get rid of that, and here we're gonna get two times gamma times one minus pi. Um, at the same time, if player one decides to go for S under the same circumstances, then with probability pi, he's in this state of the world, uh, he gets zero times beta plus one times one minus beta. Uh, plus with probability one minus pi, he will be in this state and here he gets zero with probability gamma plus uh, uh, one with probability one minus gamma. Um, uh, this is one because beta is equal to zero, so this is pi plus one minus pi um, times one minus gamma, right? And of course, if the player is indifferent between playing B and S, which he should be because he's playing uh, a mixed strategy uh, with the weights that are strictly between zero and one, then this expression must be equal to that expression. So we have our indifference condition, uh, two gamma one minus pi is equal to pi, uh, plus one minus pi minus gamma one minus pi, right? And so I can solve for gamma. Um, this is just one divided by three one uh, minus pi. Right. And uh, the last thing that we need to do is we need to check that this gamma is indeed a probability. Uh, it's, a, uh, it's an expression where uh, the, you know, with, with some parameter pi and parameter pi is known, but depending on what, you know, uh, what is the value of that parameter, we can have that this expression um, uh, is, is either well, it cannot be negative because it's one minus pi and pi is between zero and one, but it can be larger than zero. So we need to make sure that um, we need to make sure that one divided by three, one minus pi is less or equal than one. Um, and so under this condition, uh, then gamma is, uh, less than one, and then alpha equal to one third, beta equal to zero, and gamma equal to that number is um, a mixed strategy, uh, Bayesian Nash equilibrium in this game. 
Now, as I, you know, we started solving this problem by say, by considering the case where gamma is strictly between zero and one. Uh, you can do the same thing by uh, assuming that beta is strictly uh, 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 between zero and one and sort of do similar derivations. Uh, there's going to be nothing new there. You, you may get some, you know, different numbers, but, but the whole logic is going to be exactly the same. And you may find some more mixed strategy Nash equilibria there. Of course, um, uh, one of them has to be either gamma or beta has to be strictly be between zero and one, because if they are both on the border, if they're both either zero or one, then we are in the realm of uh, pure strategies, and there we already exhausted all the possibilities. We already know what happens when we just restrict our attention to uh, pure strategies in this game. The previous example had a very simple inf information structure in which uh, player two was informed about uh, his preferences and player one was uninformed about the preferences of player two, and that's the only asymmetry that was there. And a natural question to ask would be, um, can I introduce uh, a more complex information structures into, um, into this framework of uh, Bayesian games? And um, again, I'm going to give you an example. And after this example, we're going to generalize this framework of Bayesian games and um, provide all the uh, formal definitions and, uh, and, and, and uh, results. But for now, let's look at another example. And the purpose of this example is to look at information structures that are a bit more complex than what we've seen uh, before. Um, here's a Bayesian game. It's a game of two players. They have uh, two actions available to them each, A or B, um, and A or B. So this is player one, this is player two. There are some payoffs in these matrices. Um, at the moment, they are not important, so you can ignore them. Uh, what's important is there are three possible scenarios, uh, a scenario that I call W1, W2, and W3, and the probability of scenario W1 is one half, probability of scenario W2 is one third, and the probability of scenario W3 is uh, what's left, which is one six. Um, however, now, given this, we're going to um, reveal partial information about these scenarios to, uh, to the two players and we're going to do it in a very um, peculiar way. Um, so let me draw these scenarios as, 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 as you know, uh, here as W1, uh, W2, and W3. And what we want to do here is we want to say that player one knows if the scenario W3 has realized, uh, but he doesn't know whether scenario W1 or W2 is realized, meaning that he cannot distinguish between scenario W1 and W2. Okay? And um, at the same time, uh, player 2 will know if scenario W1 has realized, but he will not be able to distinguish between scenario W2 and W3. Okay, know that together they will be able to say which scenario is realized because we can ask player W1, is it player player two, sorry, is it W1? And if he says yes, then it's W1. If he says no, that we know that we're somewhere here. And then we go can go to player one and ask him, is it W3? And then if he says yes, then this is W3. And if he says no, then we know that the only th remaining um, option is W2. So together they have enough knowledge to distinguish between all of these, uh, but separately their knowledge is not, is not perfect. So um, how are we going to model this? Well, we're going to bring back our fictitious um, character into this game, which we called nature before. And remember, in my previous example, the nature was just um, sort of matching players uh, together, right? So we said that uh, in the previous game there were two types of player two, and then depending uh, on, on the scenario, the, the nature is going to match player one with one type or the other. Okay, and here 
we're going to make it a bit more complex. So here nature is going to first pick a scenario and the nature is going to do that according to this distribution. So uh, nature is going to flip a, a, a coin with uneven sides and there's going to say, well, it's either W1 or W2 or W3. And then after picking a scenario, uh, nature is going to send information to players, but that information is going is, is to be uh, written in terms of signals. So for instance, uh, remember that we said player one will be able to tell us whether this state is realized or not. So player one will receive one of the two possible signals, something that I'm going to call signal T uh, one, two, and a signal T11. Okay, so after the state, after the scenario is realized, um, uh, nature is going to send player one message T12 if that was the state that is realized and it's going to send message T11 if one of these two uh, scenarios are realized. And note that by looking at these messages, player one will be able to say, if he receives this message, he says, ah, it must be that we're in scenario W3. If he receives this message, he says, well, it must be that we're in either W1 or W2, but I don't know which one because I received the same message in these two scenarios. All right. And um, similarly, um, the nature is going to send a message T12 to player two if scenario W1 is realized and a message T uh, two, two, if one of these two scenarios are realized, and this is in line with our previous assumption that said that player two will be able to tell us if scenario double one is realized, and how does he tell us? Well, if he receives this message from the nature, he says, well, it must be W1. If he receives this message from the nature, he says, well, I know it's not W1, but I don't know whether it's W2 or W3. Okay, now just to um, clarify my notations here. So the, you know, the messages have a subscript and a superscript. Um, a subscript is the name of the message. This is message number one. This is message number two. And the superscript is the, um, uh, is the address, is the person who receives that message. So these are the messages for player one and these are the messages for player two. And this is just notation. In fact, this is a notation only specific to this particular example. Uh, it's not you know, at all universal. Um, now, using this language of uh, scenarios, or as we will re refer to them in the future, states of the world and messages, we can model a very, very complex information structures, right? So we can, you know, you can imagine a bunch of scenarios and then, you know, some partially revealing messages and so agents having just partial information, that information may be overlapping with some other agents. Um, so, you know, it can be arbitrarily complex. So this tool is very, very useful in modeling asymmetric information in these normal form games. And so from now on, this is what we're going to use. Okay. Um, there's one more thing that is missing. Uh, before, if you remember, when I was calculating the expected payoff of player one, I was using, uh, because it was expected payoff, I was using the probabilities of different states realizing um, in those expressions, okay? Now, of course, the players, there's a common knowledge of the, of the game, so players know these probabilities. However, when they will compute their expected payoffs, they're not going to use these probabilities because they, re before they play the game, they receive an extra information from the nature. In particular, for instance, player one 
uh, uh, will sometimes know that state of the world W3 is realized and then he can safely ignore W2 and W1. Uh, however, of course, the problem is what, what do we do when he receives a message T11 and that message is only partially revealing, right? So this message is useful, but it doesn't tell you which state you're in. So what he's going to do is he's going to take this distribution and we're going to um, refer to this distribution as his ex ante beliefs about the state of the world. So this is what he believes about the state of the world before actually um, playing the game. And after receiving information, he will have to update those uh, beliefs. Um, and once he updates the beliefs, he's going to be, he's going to have exposed beliefs and those exposed beliefs uh, uh, will be featured in his expected payoff expressions. So, for updating beliefs, we will use base rule. And um, the fact that we're using base rule is the explanation for the, the, the name of this class of games. We, we refer to them as Bayesian games. That's because uh, in those games, we're going to assume that players are using base rule to update their beliefs. Uh, I'm not going to go over base rule just now uh, in full detail. Uh, because for this, you know, for the purpose of the Bayesian games, the base rule is actually, you know, um, it's, it's, it's very simple. But I'm going to come back to base rule. I'm going to discuss it more when we introduce dynamics into these games. So for now, here's what I'm going to say. Well, uh, we're looking for a belief of the player about the state of the world. So let's say we're looking at... Um, uh, the probability of W1 conditional on the information which is signal T11. All right, so this uh, is a posterior belief of player one after about state of the world W1 when he receives this message. So conditional on, on receiving that information. Uh, so he will have to update using this information. Well, um, what he's going to do is he's going to renormalize probabilities that are inside this message. And the normalization is going to be such that they add up to 1. So now if you just take W1 and W2, uh, they don't add up to 1, right? So it's 1 half plus 1 third. Uh, so we will have to renormalize these probabilities in such a way that they add up to 1. Why do we want them to adapt to 1? Well, that's the only thing that is possible. If I receive this message, I know that W3 has, is not possible. So the only thing that is possible is W1 and W2. Of course, the total probability of W1 plus W2 must be equal to 1. Right? So this will be the probability of um, W1 divided by the probability of receiving the message uh, T11. Okay, and note that this is not uh, a bias rule in its general form. It's the bias rule for this particular case. Uh, and I'm going to come back to the bias rule in general um, later. Um, but what's the probability of receiving message T1? Well, that's the probability of this state plus the probability of this state. And so if I plug in the numbers, I'm going to get something like this. I'm going to get 1 half divided by 1 half um, plus 1 third, um, which is uh, 6 uh, divided by 10. Okay, and I can do, I can write these posterior beliefs for every state and for every message using uh, uh, a similar rule. So one thing that happens naturally is, is the following. Remember, ex ante, before the game 
has begun, player 1 believes that W1, the state W1, happens with probability 1 half. And after he receives message T1, that probability goes up to 6 over 10, and this is larger than 1 half. And of course, this is not, uh, you know, this is not surprising. He received some information in favor of state W1. That information says that state W1 is now more likely. And that's why um, that probability went up. At the same time, if he receives message T11, his posterior belief about W3 is going to go down because um, the message T11 is not in favor of, um, uh, of, of this state. And in fact, uh, the, prob the posterior belief about this state is going to go down all the way to zero uh, because message T1 uh, says that state W3 was not the case, did not realize. Now that we have uh, posterior beliefs, we can essentially do the same thing as we did before. Uh, so the, the one way to look at this is to say that now this is the game uh, with four players uh, because there's going to be two types of player one. So we can treat them as two separate players. And then there's going to be two types of player two. We can treat them as two separate players. So it's a game with four players, um, you know, writing down a game with four players is, is, is difficult, so we're not going to do that explicitly, but implicitly we're going to keep that in our mind when we solve for a Bayesian Nash equilibrium. Um, now, I'm going to say that a strategy uh, for player one is going to be two actions. One action that he takes uh, after receiving this message and some other action that he takes after receiving this message. And for player two, again, the strategy is going to be two actions, uh, an action that he takes after receiving this message and the action that he, that he takes after receiving uh, this message. And so you can see where it goes when we, when we generalize this game, our strategy, the definition of the strategy is going to be a mapping from um, space of messages into the space of actions. So we're, we're going to have to have a function that for every message uh, that we can receive is going to tell us what action should we take um, as, as a player. To illustrate how we use um, posterior beliefs, let me uh, look at this example and consider a certain strategy profile and check whether that strategy profile is uh, a Bayesian Nash equilibrium. Uh, so essentially what I'm going to do here is I'm going to guess something and then verify it. Um, this strategy profile is going to be uh, a mixed strategy profile. Um, as a parameterization, let me say that player one plays action A with probability alpha i um, after receiving a signal ti1, uh, meaning that alpha1 is the probability of playing A when you receive signal 1 and alpha 2 is the probability of playing A after receiving signal 2. And similarly, for player 2, we're going to say that beta 1 is um, the probability of playing A after receiving signal T1, 2 and beta 2 is the probability of playing action A after receiving signal T2, 2. Um, and so the guesses that I'm going to make are, are the following. So I'm going to say that this is one half, this is one, um, this will be uh, one six, and this will be one. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to check whether this strategy profile is a Bayesian Nash equilibrium. So in order to do that, I need to write down the payoffs from playing action A and the payoff from playing action B after receiving different messages for player one and for player two. So in total, there's going to be um, uh, there's going to be uh, two pairs of payoffs for player one and two pairs of payoffs for player two. Um, so let me start with following. So I'm going to look at the 
expected payoff of player one when player one plays action A. Um, and um, his uh, opponent is playing according to this strategy. So I'm going to put dots here. And then the state of the world is W. Uh, and that I will look at conditional on receiving signal T11. And just to remind you, when I receive this signal as player 1, I know that we're not in state W3, we're either in state W1 or W2. That's, what, that's how we set up our information structure. So, um, I am either here or there. Um, so with probability W1 conditional on T11, I am in this matrix. Um, and note that this is my posterior belief. Um, so I'm using that to compute my expected uh, payoff. So with this probability, I'm in this matrix. And if I play action A and my opponent <coughs> is playing, uh, you know, according to this um, uh, strategy profile, then what I'm going to get is one with probability that action A is played. So it's one times, what is the probability that action A is played in this state of the world? Well, to remind you, the second player actually knows when this state of the world is realized, uh, the nature sends him a signal T1, T, T12, and he knows that he's in this state of the world. Um, and so there he's gonna play uh, action A with probability beta one. And um, uh, with the remaining probability player one is gonna get minus one. So this is what happens in state W1. Um, and then in state um, uh, W2, that from my point of view as a player one is going to happen with this probability. So in this state, um, if I play A, I'm going to get one with the probability that player two is replying with A and minus one with probability that player two is replying uh, with B. And recall that <clears throat> in this state, player two is gonna receive signal T22, and so uh, he's gonna play A with probability uh, beta two, so I'm gonna get one times beta two plus minus one, one minus beta two. And um, <clears throat> Now, to remind you, so beta 1 is given to us here, beta 2 is given to us here, and this probability uh, we calculated in the previous slide, and that probability was um, 6 over 10, and therefore this probability, because they have to sum up to 1, this is 4 over 10. So, um, if I plug everything in, I'm going to get 6 over 10, times uh, 1, 6 um, plus minus, uh, this is 5, 6 uh, plus 4 over 10 um, and beta 2 is equal to 1 therefore this goes away so it's just times 1 um, <clears throat> So overall, it's going to be 4 over 10, which comes from here. Uh, this is minus 4 over 6, so 6 goes away, minus 4 um, over 10, and this payoff is equal to 0. Um, let me calculate the payoff from playing uh, the other action, which is action B. Well, um, 
it's the expressions are going to be exactly the same except for one that came from here is going to replace it's going to be replaced with minus one minus the one that came from here is going to replace with one um, and one that came from here is going to replace by minus one and one sorry minus one that came from here is going to be replaced with this one right so uh, because the only thing that changes from here to here is the action that uh, player one takes it changes from a to b so we have to sh go from this row into this row and from this row into this row um, so let me rewrite um, minus one times beta one plus minus uh, plus one um, minus beta one plus that minus one uh, beta two plus one minus beta two. So when I plug all the numbers that that I used before, I'm gonna get six over 10. And uh, over here, um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll redo the whole exercise, but note that this expression is equal to minus that expression because I replaced ones with minus ones and minus ones with ones. So in fact, I can immediately conclude that um, it's gonna be equal to zero, but just maybe to be on the a bit more detailed, I'm gonna get something like this. And this is indeed zero. Um, so the act, the payoff that I get from action A as player one uh, after receiving signal T11 is zero. Uh, the, the payoff from that I get from action B is also zero. Um, what does it mean? It means that I am really indifferent between playing A or B. Um, so I can play either A or B or any uh, combination of thereof or any lottery over the, over the two. And indeed in the uh, strategy profile that I suggested, player one after receiving signal number one plays a mixture with uh, probability one half he plays A and with probability one half he plays B. And so indeed this is the best reply to this strategy profile because under this strategy profile player A, player one is indifferent between A and B. So, um, so I'm going to put check here uh, saying that um, that part is correct. Okay. Now um, I can do the same thing for um, uh, player number one uh, when he receives another signal which is signal um, T21 and check whether he, wh wh what are his preferences over A and B. The expected payoff of player one when he plays A conditional on signal uh, T12 is uh, is easier to compute than, than for the previous signal. And the reason for this is that this signal uh, reveals to player one that they are in the, that we're, we're in state W3. Um, and in state W3, my posterior is degenerate. It just says that state W3 happens with probability one. So uh, I will not have to take uh, an expectation with respect to the state, all I have to do is I have to take the expectation with respect to the strategies of the mixed strategy of my opponent. Um, so if I play A, I'm going to get two here with probability uh, with which player two plays A and then happens with probability beta two. And that's because um, in state W3, uh, player two receives signal number two and therefore 
he acts according to this instruction. And then uh, with the remaining probability, I'm going to get zero. So this is just two times beta two, which is equal to just two because beta two is one. And uh, the expected payoff from playing uh, B under the same circumstances is zero. And for that, I don't even need to know the probability uh, because um, no matter what my opponent is doing, um, I'm going to get zero. And note that two is strictly larger than zero. So uh, uh, in this case, our best reply is unique. Um, it must be that under these circumstances, player one is playing A, right? Because A is preferred to B. And therefore, alpha two must be equal to one. And in fact, in, in, the, in the conjecture uh, that I made, alpha two is one. So this is correct. So I'm going to put check here. Um, let's look now at uh, player two. And we're going to uh, check his uh, best reply after receiving message number one. To do that, we're going to compute the payoff of player two from playing A, conditional on everybody else following this equilibrium strategy, and conditional on player two receiving signal number one. Well, signal number one is going to reveal uh, to player two that they are in state W1, so he will know that uh, perfectly. So again, just like here, I will not have to bother with the posteriors because the posterior is just one. Um, and if I play A as player two, I'm going to get one with probability one half or alpha one. And I'm going to get minus one with probability one minus alpha one. And you can see that uh, this is one half, this is one half. So overall, this payoff is zero. What about the payoff from action B under the same circumstances? Well, if I play B, I'm going to get minus one with probability alpha one plus one with probability one minus alpha one. And it's easy to see that this is also zero, uh, which means that player two is indifferent between A and B. And because he's indifferent, his best reply is to play anything. Anything goes. Playing A is fine, playing B is fine as well, or any mixture between the two is, is, is also fine. And in fact, what I suggested is that he plays um, uh, uh, a with probability one six and B with probability uh, five six and this is this is fine so that's correct. Uh, just um, maybe uh, one thing to point out so uh, these payoffs are zero and um, you know this is just because this there's a lot of symmetry around zero in this matrix. Um, <clears throat> uh, but for the conclusion that beta has to be in the interior, we don't have to get the pairs that are equal to zero. It's just a coincidence. Uh, if as long as they are the same, we're fine. Uh, finally, let's look at um, uh, uh, this uh, part of the strategy of player two. Um, in order to check that, we need to compute the payoff of player two uh, when he plays A conditional on message from the nature that, or from, you know, conditional on the signal T22. Um, well, this signal tells him that he's either in this state or in that state. Um, and, um, uh, but he cannot distinguish between W2 and W3. Um, so let's compute uh, this payoff. Well, it's going to be the probability that we are in state W2 
conditional on T22. And so in this state, what's going to happen? Well, uh, if he plays A, then he's going to get minus 1 um, with uh, probability 1 half, and he's going to get 1 with probability 1 half. And that's because when we're in this state, player 1 receives message T11, and then therefore he mixes with these these probabilities. So minus 1 with probability 1 half and 1 with probability 1 half is going to be overall 0. So I'm just going to put 0 here right away instead of writing a long expression. Um, <clears throat> plus with um, uh, uh, you know plus we, we uh, uh, there's a possibility that we're not in this state but in this one so with probability w3 conditional on t22 we are in here, and in here, when I play A, uh, I'm going to get 2 um, uh, with probability 1. And I'm going to get 0 with probability 0, so this is just 2. Okay? Now, what is the probability that we're in state W3 uh, conditional on this signal? Well, remember, the probability of this state is uh, 1, 6. Um, so it's 1, 6, but then we have to renormalize um, 1 third plus 1, 6. And overall, here's what's going to happen. So this is going to be 1 third. times 2, which is 2 thirds. Okay? And finally, the payoff from playing B under the same circumstances In state W2, we're going to get 1 with probability 1 half and minus 1 with probability 1 half. So overall, this is 0. Plus, um, in, in, this, um, in this state, we're going to get 0 uh, overall. So this is zero. Now you can see from this expression that two thirds is larger than zero, and therefore um, uh, player two under those circumstances must play A, meaning that beta two must be one, and it, it is one in, in fact. So uh, we, we've just checked that this strategy profile is a best reply to itself, meaning that this is a Bayesian Nash equilibrium. Now, you may ask, okay, that's fine, uh, you have guessed some numbers and then uh, you've checked them, so this is a relatively easy task. Uh, and by the way, we did this not because uh, uh, it's an interesting task, task per se, but because we wanted to see how do we use this transition from prior beliefs, the beliefs with which the nature chooses states W1, W2, and W3, to our posterior beliefs, um, i.e. the beliefs of the agents when they receive this additional information coming from nature in the form of the signals. And so this is the illustration of how you do that. You basically plug in the posterior beliefs in the computations for the expected payoffs, and then you just need to um, use the base rule uh, to compute those posterior beliefs. And so this was why we, we did this example. But then you may ask, that's all fine, uh, but you've, you've got a game, how do we find all equilibrium in that game? And so we're not going to do it in these lectures, and the reason is, is the following. Um, you do it in, the, in exactly the same way as you do any game in normal form with finitely many actions and finitely many players. Um, it's a, it's a you know, fairly tedious task, but there's nothing conceptually new here. Um, you can think of this as 
a game of four players, and then you can rewrite the payoffs for those players um, using the expectation, using the, the posterior beliefs, and then you can simply solve uh, for Nash equilibria of that game. The problem, of course, is that, and the reason why it is tedious is because it's a game of four players, so it's a fairly large game, and finding all equilibria is going to take, you know, it's going to take me a fairly long time, so, um, uh, so I'm not going to do this uh, in the slides, but, but I'm not doing this just because there's nothing conceptually new. The two previous examples uh, have given us uh, a pretty good idea on uh, how do we approach uh, a normal form game with asymmetric information. And I think now we're ready to uh, formalize this into a, a general framework. So what is the Bayesian game? Well, I'm going to list um, some components of this game and you will see immediately how they match uh, to what we did uh, in those two examples. The first component is, um, as always, a set of players, N. And just like before, we're going to label them with some numbers from 1 to N. Here there's nothing new. The second component is something that I already mentioned uh, informally, and this is the list of actions. Um, so this list of actions is going to be specific for each player. So this is set of actions for player i. Each element of this set is something that the player can do in the game. And if you remember before, when we defined uh, a game in normal form, we started immediately with strategies. And here I'm replacing those strategies with actions. The reason for this is going to become clear in a second. But Briefly speaking, that's because strategies are going to be something that is a bit more complex than, than actions. Strategies are going to be instructions that are going to tell the agents what to do after each possible signal that the nature is going to send to the agent. So that's why I start with actions, and then uh, I'm going to build strategies on these using these actions. Okay, so AI is the set of actions for each uh, player, and then... Um, if you remember, we introduced a fictitious uh, character in the game, which was nature. Um, and this nature is going to pick um, a state of the world. So there's going to be a set omega, capital omega, that consists of omega 1, omega 2, and so on and so forth. Um, so this is the state, this is the set of of the states of the world. Um, now, in here I've written it as if this set is countable, uh, but it doesn't have to be the case. In fact, uh, this can be a continuum. Um, so if, you, if you'd like to be a, a bit more general, then you can just skip uh, this description and just say that there's some set omega and um, and uh, this set is um, the set of all possible states of the world. Now, this nature is going to draw one state in the beginning of the game, and it's going to do that with probability P uh, of W. Um, of state w. So this is a function that for each state is going to tell us how likely that state is. And of course these probabilities will have to sum up to 1. So if I sum um, this p of w over all the states in omega, uh, I'm going to get 1. Next, um, once the state is drawn, the nature is going to pass some information to the players. And in order to do that, um, um, the nature will have to use signals. So each player is going to be endowed with a set of signals that this player can receive.
Um, and the nature is gonna use uh, um, you know a certain rule. So that rule we're gonna call um, um, a signal function. Uh, let me denote it by tau i. So this is a signal function that the nature is going to use for player i. And so this tau i maps states of the world into signals. Okay, so this is the rule. You, you can think of this as a rule that the nature is going to use to send signals um, uh, to agent i. So it's going to take this function, a plug in uh, the realized state of the world and then as an output the nature is going to get a signal and then pass this signal um, to um, um, uh, to the player okay and um, uh, note that you know we can impose a, you know a very complex information structure using these uh, this machinery uh, we're gonna say that um, I'm going to put this in brackets. Uh, player i can distinguish uh, between the two states, omega and omega prime, um, if and only if uh, tau i of omega is not equal to tau i of omega prime. Um, and this statement should be read in the, in the following, or should be understood in the following way. Um, so he can distinguish between them, meaning, you know, this means that he can tell them apart. It doesn't mean that he can say for sure that he's in state w or state w prime. Uh, it, it, the, the way to check this in practice would be uh, to approach the agent and say, look, I'm going to tell you something, you know, I'm going to tell you some uh, information, and that information is that we're either in state W or in state W prime, and nothing else is possible, okay? And now look at your signal and tell me, are we in state W or in state W prime. So tell me exactly the state. Conditional on this information that we're in either in, in one of the two and there's no third state lurking around. And then the agent would be able to tell them apart if this is true about the signal, if, if the signal that he receives in W is different from the signal that he receives in W prime. If it's not, then he wouldn't be able to tell them apart. Okay? Um, Agents will, um, or players, will use um, bias rule to update their beliefs. about uh, the states of the world. Um, well, that bias rule is, is very simple. Uh, when agent receives a signal t, what is the probability that state of the world omega is realized conditional on signal t? Well, uh, that is the... Um, probability of a joint realization of omega uh, and t uh, divided by the probability of t. Okay, and you can unpack this, uh, you can essentially uh, use the sum of these probabilities, so this is going to be the sum um, across all omega prime in omega of the probability of omega prime t.
And as I said before, this is simply a normalization. So uh, we look at the signal, we collect all the states that are possible under that signal, and we renormalize um, the probability of a particular state by dividing it by the probability of, of receiving that signal. Right? So this is what it says here. Um, now this rule is written, so I've written it in, in, in this way because uh, under some conditions, so suppose you receive the signal and state omega is not possible under that signal, so your posterior has to be zero and this formula is in, in fact going to give you a posterior of zero because when t is not compatible with omega, the probability of the joint realization is going to be zero. So this is a, a rule that works generally for... Um, uh, uh, for everything. So, uh, what, what are the payoffs in, in this game? How do we define the payoffs? Well, uh, we're going to define the payoffs as uh, a function ui. So, this is the payoff of player i. And that function um, maps um, uh, maps the following objects into real numbers. Uh, these are the actions for player one, these are the actions for player two, and so on and so forth, all the way to player n. And so overall this set is the set of action profiles. So an element that lives in this set is an action profile, and the action profile is a vector uh, that gives an action to each player. So it's a vector of length n. The first element of that vector is the action that is taken by player one, second is by player two, and so on and so forth. So, and naturally our payoffs are going to depend on actions that are taken by players, and this information is recorded in this set, but also uh, our payoffs are going to depend on the state of the world. Um, so I'm going to add Cartesian product with omega here, and my payoff function is going to map this information into real numbers. Okay, so in order to know uh, the payoff of, of, of the player, what we need to supply is all the actions that are taken by all the players, including himself and the state of the world, because the payoffs will depend on the state of the world. All right? And finally, um, here I'm going to do something that is not part of the definition of Bayesian game, but, but this is already, you know, sort of a, an additional construction, but I think it's a good idea to write it here. Uh, uh, it's a strategy. What is a strategy? Um, so a strategy, and here I'm going to start with a pure strategy. I'm going to denote it by SI. So what is a pure strategy? Well, uh, a strategy in this world would be um, a complete description of what the player should do in this game. And note that the player is going to be, um, uh, uh, is going to have a, a variety of his private personal scenarios. Uh, and those personal scenarios are described by the messages that he can receive. So we need to tell him what he needs to do after receiving each possible message from the nature. So naturally my strategy is a mapping from ti, it's a function that maps ti into the actions that are available to player i. Okay and uh, if you look at this definition, I think everything, given the, the examples that we considered earlier, everything should be more or less straightforward. So, so the, the set of players is straightforward. So the actions in the examples that we considered before, the action set would be just two items for each player. So for instance, in the, in the last example, it was A or B. So those are the actions that are available. Uh, the, set, the set of the states of the world, so in the last example, again, for example, uh, it's uh, W1, W2, and W3. 
So those are the three possible states of the world. And we were given some probability distribution over those states, as a, and we called it a, a prior belief. Um, and those were one half, one third, and one six for state W1, W2, and W3, um, respectively. And then for each player, we had a set of signals. And to remind you, in the example, we had two signals per player, signal one and signal two uh, for one player and for the other. Uh, and then uh, we discussed uh, these signaling functions. Um, so, you know, we, we, we modeled our inf information structure using this approach of signaling functions. And in the previous example, let me give you one signaling function. Uh, for player one, uh, if the states are either W1 or W2, the nature would send a signal number one. And if the state is W3, then the nature would send a signal number two. Um, <clears throat> now, player used Bayes rule, so we, we used that in our uh, discussion of the example. And the payoffs were mapping from actions and the states of the world. And that's why we had uh, three matrices each two by two, so two by two is the two actions per, per, per each player, and then three matrices were one for state W1, the other one was for state W2, and the third one was for state W3. So uh, really our payoffs were functions that were mapping action profiles and states of the world into real numbers, so it's all good here. And finally, a pure strategy for player I is an instruction, uh, it tells him what to do when he receives signal number one or signal number two. And indeed, um, both pure and mixed strategies looked like that. Uh, we said that if I receive signal number one, then I act you know, according to one distribution. If I receive a signal number two, I act differently. And so this is recorded here, okay? By the way, the mixed strategy, you can immediately see how you generalize these to a mixed strategies. You just take all possible pure strategies and then you throw um, a probability distribution uh, over them. Um, yeah, so that's, um, that should be more or less clear. Now, as the last thing, let me give you a little bit of a jargon that I used in the past and I'm going to continue using, uh, and now it should become uh, crystal clear. Um, so I'm going to call these states of the world as, as before. Uh, these messages that the players are going to receive, I'm going to often refer to them as types of a player. So in the previous example, a player one, let's say, was uh, he could receive signal one or, or signal two. And then I would refer to a player one who received signal number one as type one of player one. And then type two of player two, of player one, sorry. Um, so I'm going to use these interchangeably. And in fact, um, I think I'm going to use the, 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 the language of types more often than signals, just because it's, um, it's a habit. Um, OK. And by the way, there's a, you know, <laughs> referring to this, to, to this idea, to, to these uh, signals as types, actually, um, <clears throat> uh, uh, makes it makes the link between this and the simple normal form games a bit easier. So, so we're gonna assume that these types of players we, we can treat them as separate players essentially. And so, uh, this strategy here is a collection of action one per each type now. Um, and so, this strategy basically says that well. Uh, if you have two different types, let's say, two different types of player one, then we're going to assign one action to one type and the other action to the other type. That's basically as if we're treating those two guys, th 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 those two types as different, as different people. And that's why in the beginning, when I started, I had this idea that I can take this game and, and I'm going to write a, 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 you know, a game that um, derives from it. Uh, when, where I enrich the number of players and get rid of this asymmetric information um, uh, to, to facilitate uh, solving the game, okay?